Hey everybody, welcome to the next edition of Motor H How To. You know, in this continuing series on scope use, uh, we've done quite a bit so far. We, we understand the time and voltage settings. We talked last time about trigger slope, uh, trigger position, trigger level, uh, and the different types of triggers uh, with a note that there are some advanced trigger functions depending on what particular scope you own. Uh, the time before that, we took a single channel scope and captured a relative compression waveform the only problem is if there was a weak cylinder, we weren't going to know which cylinder it was. We're going to kind of put all of that together today and uh, revisit the relative compression waveform, add a reference, and show you how to capture that pattern with a Pico scope uh, in one shot. All right, so stick around, that's coming up next. Hey, welcome back. I uh, appreciate you coming out and watching another edition of How To with me. I do want to say right off the bat for this edition, please forgive me. I'm, I'm kind of under the weather today. Uh, brought a, bu a bug back from my last uh, trip out of state and still kind of hanging on to it. So hang in there with me. If I have to grab a drink of water or clear my throat or whatever, please bear with me and we'll see if we can get through this together, okay? Um, the last time we got together, uh, we looked at trigger functions on your scope, uh, particularly uh, the trigger level, the trigger slope, and the trigger position so that you can get a stable pattern on your screen. We're going to use a feature of the Pico scope today when performing this relative compression test that will allow me to not worry about what the scope's doing while I go in and crank the engine over. It's called the single capture trigger and it's just, it's, all it's going to do is take one screen full of data and stop and I can set the trigger level so it's not going to start until I actually uh, turn the key over to the run position, the crank position. So I'll show you how to set that up here momentarily. And then we're also going to add a reference to it. Why do we need a reference? Well, I need to know where I stand in the forest relative to the trees, right? So what we're going to do is, in this case, is we're going to use an ignition event. It's a very, very popular reference uh, signal. De deploy a second channel so that we can uh, monitor the ignition events. And then it's going to be a simple matter of looking at where that occurs in relation to our pattern and uh, following the firing order if we do have a weak cylinder to identify which one is the weak cylinder, right? So let's go ahead and get started. <coughs> On uh, uh, channel A, the blue channel, I already have it selected for the high amp clamp. If you remember on the Pico, there's a menu drop down there that allows me to automatically set the scaling. Not critical if you don't have that on your scope. We just have to remember that there is a conversion, right? And remember the one we looked at last time, it was uh, one millivolt for every 10 amps. So in this case, you know, we'd have a millivolt scale if you don't have that function on your scope. Again, no worries, as long as you set your scaling high enough to catch that peak. Uh, in this case, we're looking well over 600 amps when we initially cranked the engine. Only momentary though, all right? Uh, most of our patterns should fall well here in the middle of the screen. Um, I have that set up and I'm also setting that single trigger that I told you about uh, using channel A, using the current. And if you can see very closely right here, I have um, the trigger, the little diamond is set. First, I moved it into the first segment, the first division. So that's uh, one tenth of the way in on my time base. And it's set at 70 amps. So the way this is set up uh, at 70 amps and also, excuse me, a rising slope. So let's re recap what that means. It's at 70 amps on a rising slope, so that's telling the scope, don't start drawing a pattern until you see that signal go from below and up to that 70 amp threshold. And once you see that, Mr. Pico, I want you to start drawing the pattern on the screen. Now I could do the declining slope, and then I'd have to alter where I'm placing that a little bit. Really not gonna be effective for what I'm doing today on, on that cranking amperage. What I'm trying to do here is that when I go in to crank the key, I don't want to see it start drawing a pattern as soon as the smallest amount of current starts flowing because uh, that's going to happen as soon as I pass the, the on position, correct? So I want to see it after that starter motor has just started turning. That's why I want to see it start drawing the pattern. So that's why I've selected that 70 amp level. Um, it's going to be set on the rising slope, like I said, first 10%, that's the trigger position. So we have all three elements covered, right? We have trigger level, trigger slope, trigger position. Right about here is where I should start seeing the pattern uh, begin. Now, on the red uh, channel, uh, channel B, I have a reference signal set up. And what I've selected on this vehicle is the number one ignition coil. Now, let me say right off the bat, it doesn't have to be number one. Use the one that's the easiest to get to. 
Uh, and then where do you go in the coil? Well, it depends on the coil design. Uh, if you can access the backside of the coil, you can place your uh, scope lead, uh, the one lead on the battery negative, of course, and then the other uh, to the ground side of the primary coil. Uh, you can check that on your schematic. Now, this is for two wire coils. It doesn't apply across the board for all coils. Um, in my case, it was a little easier to go right to C2 on the ECM. It's wide open, it's very easy to get to. So I'm just back probing the coil ground wire there uh, rather than going and trying to fight my way to the coil or start pulling stuff off in order to access that easier. It's just easier to go to the computer, so that's where I went for this one. Now, if you have a secondary ignition lead, then that's all you need to do there. Just use a secondary ignition lead clamp and uh, clamp over that to get your pickup. Whichever you're going to do, especially if you're going to tap into the primary side of the coil or uh, a fuel injector, same thing, keep in mind that these are coils that are energized and then turned off. Now when they're energized, what happens to the ignition coil? It creates a magnetic field. And when that magnetic field uh, is turned off, it collapses. And that's what creates that energy in the secondary side of the coil, correct? That's just your basic auto high school trade stuff you learned uh, way back when. But keep in mind that there's going to be a flyback, a kickback into the primary. Because as that coil secondary depletes, there's going to be another throwback into that coil primary. And that can be pretty high. So you have to know the limitations of your scope. Now, let me just kind of show this to you real quick. In the case of the Pico, they have what are called attenuators. That's these, these little devices here that go in line with the scope lead. And what this does is it cuts down the amount of voltage actually getting to the scope. Uh, this is 20 to 1, so that means that for every 20 volts coming in from whatever I'm connected to, only one is getting to the scope. Uh, now, when I select that attenuator on the scale, again, it's already scaled for me, so I don't have to do any math with the Pico. But what it, this does is limits the amount of voltage getting to my scope. Now, the newer Pico, I believe, has a 100 volt uh, limitation on input, and I think that primary would probably blow past that, so I don't want to let the smoke out of my scope, so I want to use an attenuator in that case. Just make sure that you check the information for your specific scope on what the limitations are, whether or not you do need an attenuator to, to take those kind of measurements or to attach to that kind of a circuit. So keep that in mind when you're looking at that, okay? So, I'm gonna set this off to the side. Grab a little drink of water here. And just recap one more time. I have my trigger set based on channel A. That's my current, high current clamp uh, attachment. Um, it's set at 70 amps, trigger level. It's set on a rising slope, trigger slope. And it's set at 10% going into uh, the screen, where my first division going into the screen. Now, what about the time base? I think we should say something about that. I'm cranking the engine over, so it's not spinning as fast as it does when, <coughs> excuse me, when um, it's actually running. So I'm basing my time base on that, and again, you can always go with a really high time base and then bring it back down to see what you want. Uh, think of your time bases and your voltage divisions uh, as like focusing on a camera. If you want to get, zoom in, then you increase the time base, uh, in, uh, decrease the voltage, and you'll zoom in on the picture, and vice versa if you're trying to zoom further out and see the, the bigger picture. Um, in this case, uh, I took and set it up to, <coughs> excuse me, have a, a five second sweep. Um, and have the uh, pattern based on the fact that, oh, let's see, let's do, do the math. If there's 180 revolutions per minute while I'm cranking, and this is just enough number used by, uh, divided by, easily divided by 60, because they're minute, 60 seconds in a minute. You with me there? <laughs> okay. Uh, so that would be 180 in 60 seconds, 18 revolutions in six seconds. But keep in mind, if I want to see all eight cylinders, well, that's take 720 degrees of crankshaft rotation, doesn't it? So that's really nine times around the clock. So if I have this set up for somewhere around that, I should see several revolutions of the engine and get a good picture of the relative compression pattern that I want to analyze, right? So with all that being said, we got it all hooked up. Let me go crank the key and let's see what we got. We'll uh, turn our scope on. Notice it's not capturing, it's waiting for that, that um, pattern. 
Let's go ahead and crank it over and see what we get. Okay, now see, do you see where the benefit of having that single trigger function on the Pico is? Uh, again, I didn't have to do anything special. I didn't have to start the scope and run around the vehicle to get in and crank it over and then come running back out trying to capture it on one screen. It, it did it all for me. And you'll probably recognize, again, the blue trace very similar to what we saw in the U-scope a couple of videos ago. All of these individual peaks, of course, represent the increased momentary increases of current draw or current load on the starter as each piston comes up on top dead center of its compression stroke. Now, here's the ignition event taken from the primary side of the ignition. Again, look how far some of these voltage spikes went, very high, 400 volts. So if I had sent that directly into my scope, it's very possible I would have let the smoke out of my scope and damaged my scope in the process. So again, I want to recap, make sure that you check the limits of your scope. And if necessary, you use an attenuating device if you're going to connect to the primary uh, as we did here. Now there's some other benefits on that primary side that we'll get into as we continue this series. But for now, let's just focus on what we're doing here. So I have here is uh, number one cylinder. So what's the firing order? Well, let's pull that up real quick. And here's the vehicle firing order, 18436572. So if I go back to the scope, I've got 18435672. So it's very easy to see that if I had an instance where one of these peaks were lower than the other, it would be very easy for me to identify exactly which cylinder that was. Now here's something else I want you to notice. Uh, let me kind of zoom in on a section of that for you using the features that we have here in the tool. And we're just gonna zoom in just to this section here. Now, we talked about checking timing with the crank and camshaft relationship and how you have to have a known good pattern. But take a look at this. Now, the ignition event's occurring right around the peak of the pattern, the relative compression pattern. Do you, do you see that? So, if the, and when does ignition occur, right? It, it's just about top dead center, just slightly before, maybe 10, 15 degrees before top dead center, right? So, if I were off a tooth on my timing gear, uh, or I was something, uh, something was holding up the um, sensor on the crank or something, I should see that here, you know what I mean? I should see that timing relationship being off, and that would tell me I need to go dig in a little bit deeper, that I might have a timing issue. Now, does this mean that the cam and crank are in sync? No, and again, that's something we're going to talk about as we continue in this process, but if you're worried about a timing issue, is the ignition occurring at the right time? Well, you can find out very quickly that's not the case. It's happening when it needs to happen. Now, what if I had an injector event? You know, we can take a look at that too. If I know when the injector event is supposed to occur, it would be, again, easy to add the firing order, locate where that injector event should be here in the pattern and see if that intersects to give me an idea of whether that's happening at the right time. So very quick, very simple, and it took a lot less time than dealing with the cam and crank sensor patterns, right? So consider that the next time you're looking at that. Now, the other thing I wanted to point it out uh, on the relative compression, again, we talked about before, all of these peaks are uniform and they're all occurring roughly, oh, 160, 170 amps. And if you look at the height, that can be a clue as to the overall health of the engine as well. So we can take some cursors down and get a measurement on that height. We'll just take one along the top one along the bottom. And we're actually showing about an 84 amp variance from peak to valley. Now, what is that telling me? If, if there was an issue with the uh, timing, again, wouldn't that affect all cylinders equally? Lowering the compression equally? Yes. And what you'll see in those cases is you won't have that high a peak as you do here. Uh, is there a rule of thumb for that? No, again, the more you play with this, the more you use this pattern, the more you'll understand and be able to look at one versus the other. So many other things go into your diagnostic techniques other than one particular piece of information, right? You hear how the starter motor or how the engine's turning over. 
Uh, you can feel how it's turning over and we can see how it's turning over. So between all three of this, this is a good indication that number one, I think all the cylinders are healthy on this engine. If I did have one, I have the means now to identify which is which. You know, I really apologize for being under the weather. I hope I didn't meander too badly in this episode. I really look forward to uh, hearing you tell me what you think of it in the comments down there below. Uh, thumbs up, thumbs down. Hey, just trying to make sure that you can uh, do what we can to help you uh, do better as a technician and make a better living. So uh, that'll do it for this edition of How To. Uh, next time, we're gonna take a look at still the same connections we have, only gonna make one minor change. And I'm gonna show you a test that you can perform on every car that comes into your bay. And that'll help you get comfortable with your scope and might help you even sell a little more, uh, little more service and parts at the same time, all right? So until then, I'm Pete Meyer, Motor Age Magazine. We'll see you then.